Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to this episode of the Presentation Hell podcast, broadcasting from Embark Studios here in Tampa, Florida. Today, we have the privilege of being in the room with Louis Zmech. He is an assistant marketing professor at the University of Tampa, focusing on influence marketing, sales, um, personal selling, and the components of bringing all these pieces together. Louis, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. In. Oh, my, my pleasure. We we bring our sales students here to Embark Collective once a semester, and it's, so it's nice to be in one of these rooms, That's uh, excellent. like actually experiencing it. Uh, but yes, my name is Louis, uh, Assistant Professor of Marketing at the University of Tampa. I'm also the Sales Readiness Coach for the Institute of Sales Excellence in the College of Business there. So I'm really happy to be here and talk about what we do with our sales students and a little bit about me and, and how it's all a sales presentation, if you will. Yeah, let's talk about if everything's a presentation and all the world's a presentation and all the world's a stage. I know some famous people said that. Well, at least Shakespeare is credited with all the world's a stage, but really all the world's a presentation. Let's talk about social media and influencer marketing and how young people are presenting themselves in such a way that they're all individual brands and some of them making incredible amounts of money, and some of them are making a living. And I know at, at my company, Shuffler, I have a direct need for a social media person to keep our brand identity culture alive and in there. Tell us a little bit about some of the things. So brand identity is a really interesting piece. Um, when I start off any one of my classes, I go throughout and look at all the different brands that people are wearing or representing themselves in some way the sticker you put on your laptop, the clothes that you choose to wear, the logos that you choose to represent that day, you're saying something about your personal brand, right? Okay. Uh, and so you're making an outward expression of this is the personality that I'm portraying today. And so that, that has a lot to do with personal branding. When we talk about the act of influencing one person to another, sales, of course, is a component of that. We have an entire piece of multiple weeks of just personal branding in our sales program mm -hmm. where we work on everything from resumes to elevator pitches, learning your strengths and weaknesses, how to tie those in. Anytime you talk to someone, you're making a presentation. Anytime we talk to someone, we're taking them and putting them in a box. And what I tell my mm -hmm. students is build that box for them. If they're going to do that anyway, you might as well build that box for them. And then now you're labeled as the sales guy or you're labeled as the aspiring law woman or whatever what have you so um, we we work through all of those personal branding pieces with our students to be able to have a clear identity so no one's left thinking what did that person do again it's just oh that's so, that's what that person so did. the foundation for anyone in this situation I'm just I'm just taking from what you said yeah. is the personal brand understanding that you're no longer a monolith. Everyone is a personal brand. And that personal brand radiates from you in everything you do, in the coffee you choose, in the shirt you wear. You said the sticker on your computer, the, the, the game you went to, the whatever it is, music you listen to is all part of your personal brand. That personal brand is now really uh, critical Absolutely. to everyone, whether you're just getting a job, doing a presentation, you said aspiring lawyer or whatever it might be, everything you do that way. I think of my, you know, sons and what the, what they've done and in a way their personal brands were created before they realized that was happening. Absolutely, 100%. I think um, you know, any of my sales students that watch this will uh, automatically see the coffee and know that like that is part <laughs> of my personal brand. Uh, if I see you know, we're on uh, the same page, <laughs> I, I, I nurse the same coffee all day and I refresh uh, it by noon. I'm like, I don't need that anymore. And I'm probably three cups. in. Yeah. In fact, at the end of the semester, they get an opportunity to impersonate me for extra points at the end of the semester. And it's always coffee, some sort of suit jacket, your form. That's your brand on display. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's really important for us to identify what is that brand that we're putting out there and companies are looking for a specific person. When mm -hmm. you're going and hiring a specific person to work with you, you're looking for someone that fits a particular mold. Well, that mold is a brand. Mm -hmm. And we would love to be able to talk about ourselves in more in-depth and in complex ways. We're all very complex individuals with a lot going on. Yeah, but that's going but on it's not, inside your skull. It's not the reality that's... of, right, yeah. you, get a, you get a couple seconds to make a first impression and most of that first impression is on how you present yourself, how mm -hmm. you look, and what you're, what you're portraying. Well, well, your brand, it's almost your uniform. 
if you think about Definitely. it, like uh, for 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 on a, on a simple note, for me, I can come here and I wear my brand all the time. Yeah. That's part of me. I'm pushing a company. That's all what I'm doing. Yeah. I go home and my uniform is dad. Right. And I perform different tasks in a different way, and I have a different meaner demeanor and such. If I was a football player, I would go on a field and get all uniformed up. I would have a different brand at that moment than when I'm sitting down studying in in the library trying to get details of what's going on. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good way of putting it. We, we break it down into different categories of the brand that you portray to me in the class is going to be different than the brand that you portray to your friends, which will then be different to the brand that you portray to your parents. And that's okay. You can have different... You can have different aspects of yourself that come out at different times, um, but when we're talking about from a professional branding standpoint, you really want to hone in on who is that person that you're portraying to the business world, but more specifically, what value are you providing to the business world? Mm -hmm. Because when you're hiring someone, you don't have a lot of time to think about how is this person going to provide value all the way down the line um, through inferences or anything mm -hmm. like that. You have to have someone come out and say, Here's, how, here's what you need, here's what I know you do, and here's the value that I can provide to you. And mm -hmm. so I think I'm the best candidate for that reason. And being someone who's actually hiring a social media person right now here at Embark and looking at students bringing, bringing it in that way, um, I can tell you, and I don't know if we're allowed to do this now in, in, the, in the world nowadays, but that brand you bring forth creates a, a snap impression. They say, you know, you never get a second chance to make that first impression. And what's understood and what's known of you is, is surmised very quickly on, on approach, appearance, stature, greeting, eye contact, physicality. Do you shake hands? Do you tap on the shoulder? Do you st stand offish? Are you intellectual? Are you are looking to joke? Are you showing it off or do you just lay it out and say this is who I am and this is why I'm special yeah and those are all those are all very very important things and in today's day and age I can tell you the moment someone says I'm going to meet with you their LinkedIn profile is coming up and you're like oh all right that's totally. who they are in their resume let me go see what they looked on Insta oh that's what they do when they're partying at night let me go see what on Facebook wow they also have a big family sure and you go through all these different components yeah. of who that person is and it's almost like we, we as humans are almost made up of many different alter egos. Mm. And we play these different roles at different times. You even have different uniforms for it. I was talking about yeah. the uniform that yeah. way. And in your marketing uh, position, so to speak, over at the University of Tampa, mm -hmm. you're teaching and presenting the ideals that best um, articulate that business I should say, I don't know, business class, I'll say. Yeah. The, this is my professional persona. This is, I want, I want to be credible. I want to be thought-provoking. I want to be challenging, but a team player. Right. I want to show that I'm, on, I'm, I'm with it and I can be coachable. I can be part of what you're doing. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really important point because the, in, in a space like this, for example, if I come and interview for you and it just doesn't work out for whatever reason, that's fine. But to think that then y'all don't talk about people that you have interviewed, maybe we all do. I, I, Everyone I'm, does. I'm interesting to someone else that's in Embark or something to that capacity. And so to think that your brand does it just stops at one interaction is is foolish. So like you said, there your anything you put out online is there for presumably forever. And so every every place that you're displaying mm -hmm. yourself, whether it's in person, whether it's online, whether it's in the classroom. People are forming an identity about you, and are they going to recommend you to someone else if the job doesn't work out? You want to make sure that your brand is always represented appropriately, so I think that's a really important component. The different personas aspect of that I think is really interesting. Well, it, it makes a difference because we are, we are human. We have a depth of all different things. When I go play with my 8-year-old niece, I, I assure you, I speak in a different tone. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I'm, I will do things. I will step in the mud when I normally, if I was in another environment going out to a show, I wouldn't be stepping in the mud and I wouldn't be speaking in that tone. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you even have a different persona when you talk to your dog sure. thinking about it on that way. Yeah. And something you just said there, and I, I had a different connection here for it, and it's not really the case, is you said when people come in and interview, you can't, you can't be naive enough to say everyone doesn't talk about not who sure. this is and everything. Take that to the extreme. 
And in a college environment, people go to a party and you can't think that people aren't talking about you, what you're wearing, how you look, are you, do you have it going on, what happened with you, you all the things, and that might be more the extreme type of thing because it's very of age in, in that sure. thing. But in the business environment, it's the same thing, just tamped down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and we and we work through a lot of that stuff in the sales program as well. You know, f- For example, uh, when you come to class, you have to be in business casual, and then whenever mm-hmm. a corporate partner is present, you have to be in business professional. And that is a jarring experience for a lot of students just having to go and get professional mm-hmm. wear just to begin with. But we're setting the tone that your brand is always on display. So when we have top golf events, when we come to Embark, your brand is on display. So if you are somewhere and you're misrepresenting your brand, like like you were getting at mm-hmm. there, we do have happy hours and things like that where corporate partners are around and having alcohol and networking is part of business. Part of life, and yeah. And so being able to not only represent yourself, but know that now in the position you're in, you're representing the university, you're representing the sales institute, you're representing all of these different brands, and you have to be conscious of that. It's not just going out anymore. It's that everything that you're pr- portraying is, is on display. That makes a lot of sense. So now that we've kind of uh, discussed a little bit about the, the concept of each individual is their own brand. Mm-hmm. Each individual represents themselves in all different places. They have different uh, roles that they play, but all of them, you are the sum of them. Mm-hmm. And if you have one of them that tarnishes your character, it will probably cal- spill over to the other one. So there is a brand being, being put out there. Mm-hmm. So let's take this to social media. Now that you have the foundation of I myself am a brand, how do I t- change that to an influence? How do I make it? Because here's the deal. How do, I, how do I make the 20 grand a month that everyone talks about because I'm an influencer? How do you take that brand that is James Entra because I'm so cool and everyone wants to like wear the shirt I wear? Yeah. What's, what's the next step? We, you know, the, the, it seems like they're, they're, they're balanced. They, you need one to even attempt the other. If you don't have one, don't even bother with the other. It seems like a logical progression. For my, for my dissertation, I interviewed... Um, 12 different influencers that ranged from having a thousand followers to over 400,000. I think now they're up to 500,000 followers. And the story remained the same, that they all started with some passion that they had, whether it was showing various outfits that, that they think are cute and go together or playing video games to talking about how to style uh, hair that is unruly are the various uh, product influencers, tech influencers, a lot of different varieties of people that I talked to. And they all started with some sort of passion that they had, and that passion then eventually spills over into getting someone else interested. That snowball slowly starts to form until it just starts picking Mm -hmm. up momentum. And then you have the best of both worlds because you're doing something that you love and that you're passionate about, but that passion is getting others on board. It's very hard to form an influencing career on something that you're not passionate about, that you're not fully invested in. Because most of the time, you're starting with your own money. Mm -hmm. You're starting with, I'm just buying these products like normal. I have another job. I'm doing this on the side. And so I have to be really interested in it. Um, The college students that I come across from time to time that also have really large followings, 50,000, 100,000 followings that are getting product sponsorships, brand sponsorships, things of that nature, they're just passionate about showing people their day. They're just mm-hmm. passionate about showing people, helping other people. The, the, when you boil it all the way down, it's just helping other people. I'm broadcasting this out. Mm-hmm. If someone finds interest in it and it helps them, then great. And that's the main goal. And then eventually brands start coming on saying, well, I want a piece of that too. I want, I, I want people mm-hmm. to see what I'm, what I'm all about, what my product's all about. And then it's up to the influencer to decide, is my audience gonna like this? Does this make me look inauthentic? then there's a lot of complications that come with that as well. But a lot of it starts with, what are you passionate about? What brings you excitement to do it? Because otherwise you'll burn out. Because it takes a long time to get It doesn't following. happen it's, over, overnight. It's rare that it... it I would, it, I would reinforce that in something that uh, I, I call for social media, the difference between performance and acting. It's one thing to walk through the door and be surprised because you were something, saw something, you're surprised, and that's passion. Yeah. That's true. All of us are genuine that way. You step on my foot, I'm going to yell. <laughs> it's not, you're going to see the real expression, and people like real emotion. Yeah. They connect with it. However, an actor, and this is why the best actors get paid so much, 
they walk through that door 50 times in a row with the same passion and same, same surprise, same surprise sure. which is like exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah. a reason why they they're the best of the best up there. There, you know, to do that. Yeah. And um, the whole what you said about passion makes a big difference in that. Well, let's let's step back. Passion is is kind of an emotion. It's a feeling. Mm -hmm. Emotion creates motion. If you're emotional, mm. you make things happen. This is there, there's a reason why those words go together. They sure. Came from <laughs> Greek. Greek. Sure. You know. Yeah. You know. It's just you know things happen that way, and. And in, in so doing, the E is the passion part. That's the component that gets things moving. Mm. And when I connect with you, it's like seeing a little kid hit a baseball for the first time. You connect with that excitement that, that they start Raw running emotion. and everything. It's, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and, and you want a piece of that. And it doesn't matter if, if, if someone made a pie and they love doing it or, or someone caught a fish or they liked, you know, gluing model trains together if they're doing it just to make a show you're not going to connect but what you're saying is if it's something you're really passionate about and you 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 enjoy doing makes a difference that way well, and I, we can't we we cannot overlook this is a visual medium and the object of desire is on the screen all the time and mm -hmm. there is a big how should i say there's a reason there's 9 billion people on the planet, and it's also one of the motivators that goes behind that passion and allows things to grow. If there's an attraction, good-looking good people make it to the top of Hollywood, there's, there's a visual attraction going on there. Have you have, ever made connections that way? Uh, well, I think the, so the point of being able to feel that emotion, being able to feel when someone gets really excited about something, and you may say to yourself, well, I'm not really interested in that, but I'm here to listen to you because you're just so interested. You love it. You, it's you obvious. Love, I, yeah, clearly you yeah. like what you're doing. So I'm just going to sit here and There's something cool about it just because I don't get it. I, you know, I can feel excited. Just watch it. Yeah, exactly. So I think it, uh, there, there definitely is something baked into that. But it's more so all the, the longevity of being able to sustain that career long term mm -hmm. that only comes with I am very excited with this, this project. And it also is what gets you to actually start doing the the medium. Mm -hmm. Most people say, oh, there's so many. I'm sure you, you had similar mm -hmm. thoughts of, uh, there's so many podcasts out there. How am I going to start this podcast from the ground? But you had your book. You had... I wrote the book after the okay. podcast okay. started, so, believe it or so, not. But that must have been a very big passion project in order to finish yeah. an entire... Well, writing a book is very difficult. Year, that's a 30-year career in presentations, so. and it's... I'll take this moment to say this is a 30 year of presentation excellence being put into one book and you can learn more about culture and how presentations affect your entire organization and communication and the way people present, pre present each other and communicate in this one book. That was my ad for the moment. I love it. Yeah. Well, we talk about uh, grit is a, is a term of passion and perseverance um, that uh, Dr. Duckworth put out and and so this is a this is definitely a grit project right i mean you you have to have passion and perseverance to be able to make it through 30 years of work and then culminate it into well into I've, a book I, yeah way, i've been so. behind the screen with a thousand people and the president of the company up there and advance a slide and it doesn't come up and i'm saying hey what happened and i'm the guy sweating behind the screen sure. but i've yeah. been through that yeah. i've been through just about every component and you know in presentations, my clients, and I'll just say this out loud, have been ABC, NBC, Warner Brothers, Fox, Paramount, wow. Mercedes-Benz, De Beers, uh, BET, the NFL, the NBA. Wow. All of these companies were my clients in the aughts, I guess that's what we call after the 2000s there. And it was a consultancy, but they, they did one thing, is these are the best storytellers in the world. Mm. And they turned to entre presentations to tell their story when they were creating their advertising and selling their stories. The structure by which they put these messages together and organize their slide libraries and their slide presentations and their mm -hmm. presentation component is what we've kind of mastered and that's the discipline that presentation management is implied gotcha. on, a, on, a, on a big company. And I'll, I'll take this, this is my own selfish part, I'll take it just a little sure, bit further. Please, is, yeah. The world of communications is, is a trillion-dollar industry, whether it's TV, radio, print, billboards, 
the web and, and everything that comes with it from social media to Amazon to everything that goes into it. But the world, and this, this identifies culture. It identifies what you buy, what your Starbucks is. Mm -hmm. it, it, it lets you know what to wear. It lets you know how to speak. It knows what bullet points you should be saying. It said sure, it on the that's news. That's storytelling aspect, yeah. But there's a very ironic part to this, is that there's one medium of communication that has been left off of that. And that's presentations. Hmm. Presentations have been around forever. I mean, presentations are why they chiseled hieroglyphics into the, into the pyramids. So sure. that it'll present later on. It was why cave people wrote on the wall, so the next generation could do the same Presenting thing. Presenting their story. Yeah. It's why uh, churches and and religious operations put stained glass windows where the light comes through, just like your your damn phone right now is a glowing screen sure. and telling you a message, and you go from one screen to another to another. And they were teaching mostly illiterate masses their own message and their own, you know, th what they're what they're doing. And then you come to universities. Every co every lecture hall is built around a stage, mm -hmm. which is a presentation. A presentation, yeah. almost all of them. Yeah. But there is no discipline for managing presentations on a global scale or an enterprise scale. That's what presentation management is. That's what we've brought together in Presentation Hell. That's what Shuffler delivers for our co corporate clients, and we do this strategy for many large companies that are very credible companies you drink your coffee out of and watch yeah. your tv from and and uh get your drugs from yeah and yeah. go on your cruises with you know without naming names so that was my own personal ad but that that goes into the the component that we're in here yeah absolutely we have uh one of our corporate partners um am i allowed to yeah yeah okay. no no, so, no so problem Tom james they come in and they they do uh, they're a, cl a custom clothier. They, I, I have a jacket with the Shuffler logo in it from Tom James. Okay, perfect. So and they... have you seen that? You've seen my my Shuffler branded. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. That's Tom James. Okay, Go all right. Ahead. That's, the, that's the, a good uh, good plug for a good brand. And they they come in. They teach our students about uh, professional dress. And what their data has shown is that ninety percent of what is made up of a first impression. It's about 50% of how you look and another 40% on what you're doing with the information, how you present that information, mm -hmm. and only 10% is the actual content of that yeah. information. So the, the presentation part of it is, is a huge part of first impressions. It's a huge part of lasting impressions. Mm -hmm. It's a huge part of clicking follow, clicking like, mm -hmm. sharing, all of that. Well, judgments are made that way. They say you can't judge a book by its cover. Isn't that why the cover's there? Yeah. That's the whole reason for the cover. Yeah. Like in uh, yeah. modern America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but if, if we're going to backtrack to the, the passion component, it, in, in my opinion, I, I no longer ask students what makes you happy because most of the time it's a, it's a similar list of I want a healthy family, I want to make enough money to be financially independent, I want to be um, stable in my, in my career. Um, but that doesn't really answer the question of what are you going to do in your career. And so instead, I've been switching to asking students what excites you. Mm -hmm. And to me, that that's, has been, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if, it, if, if this actually is what's it doing or not, but it seems to be what gets people over the hump to actually going and doing the thing of, well, what really gets me excited is talking to people face to face. But if you don't say what gets you excited, you can't take the next you step. Can't it's take like the step. writing it down. If you yeah. just think it, there's so many great ideas that died with human beings who never did anything on what went in their brain. Right. Yeah, no one at the end of their life cycle is saying, I, I wish that I would have... Uh, you, you regret the things you don't do at the end of your life. Perfect. And you, when you're young, you regret the things you did last weekend. <laughs> but at the end of the uh, life, you regret the business plan you didn't do, the, 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 the love interest you didn't pursue, the trip you didn't take. Yeah, and you know, in yeah. the short term, you you regret having that extra drink last night. Well, and I think that's what's so <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that's what's so uh, interesting for a lot of people. The the avenue of social media has that ability to start from from nothing, just the the mm -hmm. device that you have in your pocket, and eventually build it to a company, an enterprise, what have you, mm -hmm. or just have it be sustainable well, it, and sustaining your life. It democratized the media companies. Basically, it used to be the, the companies I named, ABC, NBC, you know, all the networks had a control of what can be broadcast out to you. Now, every single human being has 
basically 20 years ago, it took a $40 million TV station to do what I can do in my hand right here in about 18 minutes and be published and be out there and have, uh, you know, 100,000 people viewing my thing in no time. That was like, I'm old, Walter Cronkite type of stuff. Like, that was such a privilege back in the day, even sure. 10 years ago. I want to hit on something you said. You, you said, what makes you happy? I think this is the biggest misnomer in, in America today. People are pursuing happiness. I want happiness. Yes, you want to be happy. I get that. I want to be happy, too. I know everyone wants to be happy. But the reality is happiness is fleeting, and, and it's built on being content. If you can't be content, you can't be happy. Yeah. If I can't be content where I am, like I've heard the stories of, of the, the person on the street who has everything terrible and dirty and, and asking for money, but they're happy. They're just content in their situation. Yeah. And I'm not saying everyone, and I'm not you know, being you know, yeah. whatever, but like a lot of people are upset about so many little things. Traffic coming out this way. The coffee wasn't delivered on time. I expected the door to be locked this morning. Why did that alarm go off at 10 of? I thought it'd be... And they don't realize that you don't, if you're not content, you can't be happy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are bitching about their real minor things, and they realize it destroys their happiness. I think the that that idea of happiness and excitement um, was from the four hour work week that that book oh. we're talking about the the idea that most of us are comfortable being miserable versus being uncomfortable doing something out of the out of their comfort zone mm -hmm. and but businesses are built on being uncomfortable a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, going you Going outside your comfort zone. That's, that's Stepping right. in front of a corporate partner and delivering your elevator pitch in, in 60 seconds while they're grading you is uncomfortable, but you're, yeah. then you're sharpening the ax, right? And so I think That's when you're on that fire. Is, that's when you know what's going on with this type of th stuff. Yes, yeah, exactly. So I think that it, it, it's, it's part of putting yourself in those situations that you know is going to better your career it may be uncomfortable at first, mm -hmm. but it's always uncomfortable. But in the back of your mind, you're excited about the prospect of getting that extra career bump or getting more experience or getting that internship or making that social media journey, whatever is, that is. is, is I, guess, I guess this is a bigger question. Is this what the kids at U University of Tampa are, are pursuing? Is, you know, obviously, not obviously, but colleges prepare people for, for to adulthood and be... be contributing members of society on many levels. One is in the job realm, because if you have a job that contributes and people benefit and you want to structure that way. Um, I see a lot of, through social media influencing and stuff, the diversification that way then from the old school, I want to get a job and be, be that way to, I'm going to drive my van around South America and, and chronicle it on how it works and look I can make a living and that's my career mm. um, is that a fleeting type uh, goal or as opposed to you know what I mean like I could go do that now but I give up my law degree that in 10 years might make me a reputable lawyer that I can take care of a family and everything that goes into it but I spent four years driving a VW bug in South America making some money now that that's over am i am i pursuing the nfl draft and working for five years and being all sorts of excitement and then yeah. at the end being like oh my god yeah i i i think that uh, at least in the college of business specifically that's just the only thing that i can touch on i think a lot of students come in with ideas that are maybe given to them by friends family whoever of i'm going to get this career i'm going to get this job and I think that they may come to a point, usually around junior, senior year, where other friends are starting to get internships, are starting to make definite statements of, I'm going into accounting, I'm going to be a tax accountant, or I'm going into HR, or I'm going to be a marketer, whatever. Um, and so some students tend to have a young life crisis of, I don't know if I want to do this career mm -hmm. anymore. And that's when we have that conversation. And so I'm not sure that the social media route is an aspiring goal for a lot of individuals. I think it's more sometimes it gives them the freedom of if you want to go and you want to work part-time jobs to save up enough money to go travel and then document your travel and maybe it turns into mm -hmm. something, 
this is your permission to do it. Look, I've done it. It gives the avenue to do it. It's, yeah. Those avenues weren't available. That right. was, you know, you yeah. needed, there, like in the past, the idea of earning an extra 50 bucks when you're traveling through Chile or, yeah. or Argentina was a different thing than having logging into YouTube and seeing 200,000 people saw you dive, dove into the water. Yeah, right. Or, or uh, and, and making $28 on that or $45 or whatever. I don't yeah. know the mathematics of it. Yeah. I know, you know, they always talk about the big time people making sure. too much money. Yeah, but of course. The reality is many times a lot different. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I think it gives it gives people permission to go and do those things. If you want to go pursue your MBA um, in, an, in, in Spain, for example, mm -hmm. Look, I've done it. It was great. Here's what you need to know. And now all of a sudden, mm -hmm. I've got those points, and I kind of have the freedom to do that. So I'm not sure that a lot of people that I've talked to, when I ask, was this always the end goal? At least in the individuals that I've talked to, it's always no. It's it's I I I, I came to a critical point at at where I thought to myself, can I still sustain myself based on the revenue coming in? And then they quit their job, and then all of a sudden, it starts really ramping up from there. And so most of the time, it's, it's I'm doing this thing that I love, that I'm super excited about, that I'm super passionate about. It's turning into money, which is great. Then you kind of have this freak out moment of, should I keep doing this? Like, if I do it, will I become inauthentic? And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the money stops coming in. I have a good job. W what kind of transition is this going to be? And, and then they make that leap. But most of the students that I have uh, that are coming through know that a business degree is a good avenue for mm -hmm. them to pursue. Um, they know that by taking the classes at the university that they're going to be set up and put in front of enough employers to where mm -hmm. they're going to have the job opportunities. We have an amazing career services office at, at UT that basically... And this is the psych school of business. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. And then the, the but career services uh, services all students on all majors in, in, the, uh, in the university, at the University of Tampa. And so if you want an internship, you want a job. I mean, our, our internship fair that we just had had 400-plus students there. That's I awesome. I mean, they're, they're hungry. They're, they're, we're back to pre-COVID numbers Yeah, we now. got 20 resumes I mean, from UT in the past 24 hours for our intern position. Isn't and that we'll be amazing? In, yeah. yeah. And so when we talk about branding, how do you stand out on a, on a resume when you've got 20 to look through, right? And, you, and, you're and I've seen – I saw one. some wacky stuff, I'm t I have to tell sure. you. I was looking at it sure. going like, really? Sure. And what I have noticed is some of the things that I thought were – childish it was backed up by the person who walked through the door wasn't thoroughly buttoned down buttoned up got it. got it so here take a minute here tell me the best thing about going to the university of tampa through the business school and the marketing what is if you were to talk to a 17 year old high school senior saying why why university of tampa so the University of Tampa, we have pitched it as being the hidden gem here on the river. But I don't know how hidden it is when we had 38,000 incoming freshman applications <laughs> last That's year. That's a lot. That's yeah. a lot. How many students are total at the university? Um, we've got a little over 10,000. 10,000 10, students? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we had, uh, and that's followed up the previous year, we had 44,000. So you're taking 10% of the applications because well, that's if 10, you have 10,000 students, students which they you have 2,500 new students, and if you have 38,000 uh, mm -hmm. applications for 2,000 seats. Yeah, they only, exactly, they only accepted about yeah. 2,200, yeah. So, and that's um, what you need for business, by the way, crunching those numbers backwards and forwards because it helps with negotiations. Oh, 100% it does, yeah, uh, which is something that we also teach our students. Negotiate that first contract, right? Um, but uh, we, the University of Tampa offers a really exciting opportunity for students and that we are right in the heart of downtown. We have access to all of these businesses, incubator programs, um, startup companies, startup organizations, big organizations, tech organizations, um, and that's just Tampa. Then you go over to Clearwater and you have big tech companies that are moving there as well. You have access to all of these companies in a beautiful location um, with a university that prides itself on building new facilities with new technology, but keeping class sizes small and professors accessible. So whenever I'm in my office, my door's open. That's the same all the way down mm -hmm. the hall. Um, whenever students are, are in the halls, professors are there meeting with students. Our class sizes, at least in the College of Business, stay at or below 30 students. That's and impressive. so I get to know all of my students on a name-to-name name -name basis. 
Um, they, they know me, I know them, I know what their career goals are. And so then when an employer comes to me and says, hey, I've got an internship, do you have anyone in mind? I can forward that over to those students and, and get them set up. So it creates for a more intimate environment from student to professor to employer. And I think that's really important. If, if a business school can't connect students to the business world, then we're just providing a piece of paper, right? I mean, well, that that's a big thing. That's a, a really big thing with me, by the way. There's there should be a reason and a purpose in what people are going through their education for. It doesn't mean you know it ahead of time, like you said. You can change your mind and go through it, but the act of a 17-year-old choosing to spend two hundred thousand dollars on on just information going into their brain, yeah, is a big decision. I wouldn't bring my son onto a car lot and say, here, buy your car. And he goes, I want the Bentley, and it's $200,000. <laughs> right now, yeah. I bring my son onto the campus, and he's choosing a $200,000 process. So yeah. it's actually, it, it has a bigger value than I think people really know in getting that direction, because yeah. there's nothing, you know, it's kind of like if you lose your way halfway through it, it's, the, the, the pain and student debt and stuff is really is really a, a penalty yeah. that uh, yeah it's just you know it's it's a trap in a way not I shouldn't say it's a trap it's no, a it, financial it, it, thing it, like it, people should know about this before they start making those decisions absolutely it's it's a big financial investment and when you are investing your time into something like that you want the outcome and I'm sure that you're seeing it as well that that resumes are getting more and more competitive having the checkbox of a degree is is like the base, big deal. it's the it's baseline big, though. You I want mean, to get to the party, you can't get in without it. And and so now we're seeing employers that are are looking for work experience, they're looking for internship experience um and and I'm afraid that eventually having the degree plus an internship will be the baseline. Mm -hmm. Right? And so having all of those connections, all of those resources available to students is really really important. And not just available to students, but also at least in the sales classes. Mm -hmm kind of pressed upon students of you, know, you have to, you're going to go do this. You're going to go talk to employers. You're going to go pitch to employers. And then eventually they think to themselves, you know, I didn't really think that logistics would be this fun, but it's actually really interesting, especially around this time. If your product's not on the shelf, you don't get That's to sell right. it. And, you um, want that salt on the kitchen counter. It's got to come from somewhere. It exactly. came on a truck, a yeah. bus. It was yeah. dug out of the ground. It was processed down in Louisiana. It, we we talk <laughs> about made-up holidays, right? Prime Day. Everyone knows about Prime Day. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a, a fabricated holiday that is one of the most logistical things in the world. <laughs> well, there's <laughs> actually so many of them. Every single parade almost is a fabricated holiday. Yes, we're celebrating something. Yes, it's all legitimate. But each one of them is a merchandising opportunity. Christmas is a merchandising well, opportunity. Yeah, so we're coming Valentine's up to Black, Black Day Black is, Friday. Is, is a yeah. merchandising opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what I would like to kind of sum this up and say, the representation you made of for the University of Tampa was very solid. You spoke about the, I hate the word holistic, but the holistic approach, that the fact that you're, you're building people, they have a real use in society, their direction in what goes on and understanding that commerce, which is business, is a foundation that can build for a better situation. And you also recognize that the bar is getting higher. It's not just mm -hmm. a high school degree, a college degree. Now it's a college degree intern. And yeah. can you produce on social media? Let me see your profile and everything that goes into it. Um, you also recognize that the concept of influencing your, well, A, your personal brand mm -hmm. is critical to all those things I spoke about. And that's a big foundation going forward, whether you're going to be, you know, someone comes in and they want to know if, if I hire you, will you be my boss? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's my dream of life. Longevity Everyone I company, hire, yeah. I want to some, somehow be my boss so I don't have to think about the things I hired him for. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. To be able to do the thing that not only just do the thing that you hired them to do, but then also be innovative enough, driven enough to try and add some things to better the business and to like make this whole thing run a little smoother, a little faster, a little farther. All right, I'm going to sum this up, and this is what I call all interviews that come through. Do they have snap? When they walk in and talk to you, can you discuss something? If a subject comes up that might not be what was planned, are, do they have the elegance, the, the knowledge, the ability to 
not BS their way through it, but to be a part of the situation. If you brought them to a dinner with your people from out of town, will they do that? And I feel from what you've given me that the University of Tampa is providing a well-rounded experience that produces good young adults for our society. I, I think that a, a, a UT student, especially one that comes through our sales program, I have zero, um, I, have, I have full confidence that I can put them out to a dinner with an employer in an interview and I have full confidence that they will represent not only themselves well, but the university well. And I think that's the, that's the main goal. Well, thank you. Lewis, thank you for coming in. Lewis, Va- I, I've been saying that, Zmitch. Right? <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, assistant, associate professor. At assistant. The, I, assistant I, yeah, professor I, yeah. I'm not at the quite University of Tampa <laughs> in, the, in the marketing department. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for representing it so well. I, I appreciate you coming in. We this podcast today. Thank you for listening. Presentation Hell, broadcasting from Embark Studios here in Tampa, Florida. And I've had the privilege of having a representative from the University of Tampa here today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much.